Yeah, we'll just, well, every topic, up, down, done, next. So are we, are we now live? Yes. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Township of Georgian Bay Planning Council to order at 10 o'clock on Monday, November 9th, 2020. Um, and... As per my usual habits, I would like to start this meeting by acknowledging that we are on lands that are traditionally occupied by Indigenous peoples. They continue to care for this land, they continue to shape the township of Georgian Bay, and we need to show our respect. Hundreds of years after the first treaties were signed, they remain relevant in guiding our decisions and actions. Megwitch. I'd also like to remind Council, not that I think it's necessary but we have numerous priorities with, with this council and, and values and I know we'll be discussing them at our meeting tomorrow but they include protecting and preserving our natural environment as well as municipal fiscal responsibility and transparent and representative government. I just mentioned those as items that are re relevant that we have to remember as we go through our meeting today. Councillors, do any of you have any pecuniary interests or any other conflicts as per our code of conduct or anything like that that you uh, wish to declare at this point? I'm seeing one head shaking and, uh, and everybody else silent, so we're just going to carry on. If this changes during the meeting, uh, please interrupt if you need to exit part, a portion of the meeting because all of a sudden you realize there is a conflict. Thank you. And with that, moved by Councillor Bochuk, Bochuk, seconded by Councillor Cooper, be it resolved the Planning Council adopts the agenda of November 9th, 2020, as amended to include 9E, and this is under a closed session, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipal municipality or local board, in regard to the Macy Bay LPAT lawyer. Are there any other comments or additions that anybody wishes to make? Councillor Bocek. Just to check with uh, procedures, uh, perhaps Ms. Way could help us. I do have a possible conflict of interest or pecuniary interest in our closed session. Would I be declaring it in the closed session or should I do it? to publicly declare before we go in. And then obviously you'll have to remove yourself from that portion of the meeting once we get to that item. But you have okay. to make it publicly known. Okay, and uh, I can't sign the book, so I just declare now and somebody will write it in for me? Yes. Okay, so I'd like to declare uh, a, a, a pecuniary interest or possible pecuniary interest in the closed session and I'm not even sure it's today, it might be tomorrow, but it is under the caption of Morno. My reason is I declared a, a conflict or pecuniary the first time this came by us, and it would be wrong for me to take part in the conversation. Our closed, closed session, item 9A, is in regards to the uh, Morrow zoning bylaw amendment. Is that the item you're referring to? Yes, it is, sir. That would be, that'd be for today's closed session. I have the agenda on my desktop, but not written out. And Ms. Way, if you could record this, so as part of the, let me call it public record. Yes. It would be appreciated. Thank you all. All right. Shall I read the motion again, or shall I say who's in favor of the current agenda with the, the one amendment with regards to nine, addition of 9E? Councillor Hazelton, is that a vote in favor? Yes. Okay, all those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, that's six. That is carried, thank you. All right, let's make sure I don't mess up my piles of paper. This morning, there is a public meeting scheduled for three proposed zoning bylaw amendments. I will briefly summarize the procedures to be utilized for the meeting 
First, the clerk will advise council as to when, how, and to whom notice of the public meeting was circulated for the proposed amendments being considered. The clerk will also advise of the appeal procedures. Next, staff will advise of the purpose and effect of the bylaws and provide any other information that is relevant to the applications. And the clerk will summarize any correspondence on file. From there, the public will have an opportunity to provide comments on the amendments being considered. Please be respectful of time and be concise with your comments. All commentators are requested to state their name and address and sign in on the sheet provided. Well, I think, in other words, sign in with our clerk electronically. After the public discussion, the public meeting will be closed. Council will then have an opportunity to provide comments for clarification. I now declare this meeting to be a public meeting pursuant to section 34 of the Planning Act to deal with the following approved, uh, sorry, following proposed amendments. Z20-07, Desjardins, Z20-09, Dally, Z20-18, Kings Farm Road, Housekeeping. To our clerk. Notice of the public meeting was sent by first class mail to the respective owners assessed persons within 120 to 800 meters of the property subject to the proposed applications and to those persons and agencies likely to have an interest in the applications. These notices were sent at least 30 days prior to this morning's meeting. Included in each notice was an explanation of the purpose and effect of the proposed applications and a key map showing the location of the properties or a description of the lands to be affected by the proposed amendments. Other relevant information may also have been provided. These circulations were all provided in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act and the Township of Georgian Bay Official Plan. Members of the public are advised at this point that unless they make an oral or written submission to council before council makes a decision on these applications, that any subsequent appeal to the local planning appeals tribunal may be dismissed by the tribunal. Anyone who wishes to be notified of council's decision respecting the proposed zoning bylaw amendments must submit a written request to the planning department. All right, thank you very much. With that, zoning bylaw amendment Z20-07 in regards to bylaw 2020-092 Desjardins or 201 Macy Bay Road to the planning department. I do believe that's you, Mr. Robinson, for this one. You've already, you already taken the screen. Yes, thank you, Your Worship, members of council and to all those listening. Uh, as the clerk mentioned, this is a statutory public meeting under the Planning Act. The purpose of this zoning bylaw amendment is to implement a uh, condition of provisional consent. Again, this property was previously granted conditional provisional consent by the Committee of Adjustment. Specifically, what uh, the amendment proposes is it proposes to establish specific setbacks for development from an adjacent PSW that abuts the property, which is a provincially significant wetland. It does restrict the development of any further accessory structures, specifically docks within the provincially significant wetland, which is consistent with uh, the approach taken in the township's planning documents. It does recognize a historic access point and a docking location on the western, on the western lot that provides, so it functions like a waterfront landing for a, a water access property only, and it's water access only property and it's been existing and then also would permit an accessory building prior to a principal building on the severed lot that building's existing right now it's a storage shed and it would allow or, or it's it's been historically used as a sleeping cabin it would be converted to a storage shed and uh, this amendment would allow that building to exist so no changes to that building or to the property so that's the basis for the amendment. I'll just walk through the location. And so it's located here at uh, 201 Macy Bay Road. You can see it's just off of Honey Harbor Road. And this is the subject site here. In terms of an aerial, you can see the, uh, the, the development on the site is focused in this area of the site. You'll see if the future lot line drawing, but it comes through this portion of the site. And you can see an existing roadway that, sever that services where the dwelling location is on the east. There's an existing dock here. And then you'll see there's an existing road along the, or a existing driveway along the western portion of the property that services an existing uh, dock in this area. And that's the, the access point. 
And just in terms of what's in, in the bay, this is considered a provincially significant wetland along the entire shoreline of the property. This is a sketch that was provided by the applicant's uh, consultant, which was both uh, their planning consultant was Planscape and then Riverstone Environmental conducted the EIS that supported the proposed consent to application and zoning bylaw amendment. You can see again, um, the, the existing dwellings in this location, that existing accessory building that the proposed bylaw would legalize on the severed lot is located here. The reason that's necessary is the zoning bylaw does not permit an accessory building prior to the establishment of a principal building. So the bylaw would recognize that. Um, and then you can see the existing, the roadway, the existing uh, driveway along the Western portion of the property in this location. So a couple of photos of the site. This is the existing dwelling on the property or cottage. It's a small, it's a, a fairly small cottage. This is a picture of the existing sleep cabin. So that's the building that would be legalized as the, the only permitted building on this severed lot until a dwelling's constructed. You can see the dock in the background and you can see the emergent vegetation along the shoreline that corresponds with the provincially significant wetland. This is the existing dock that's in front of the main dwelling. And again, you can see the existing emergent vegetation that uh, reflects the location of the provincially significant wetland. Just a couple more photos here. This is the access along the Western portion of the property. So this is the driveway that provides access to that existing docking area. And then just, a, this is another view of the, the front yard, so to speak, of the property and the, the existing vegetation characteristics. So as I mentioned, the amendments, this, uh, the draft amendments included at the end of the planning report. And we've made one tweak to the amendment since it was provided in the council package. And uh, the owner, and that relates to this, this bottom item here on the screen. So the last, the last point, and that relates to the owner identifying um, to their consultant after the report was published that there is a, a court order that reflects that easement and parking area and the water access um, and the water front landing and mooring facility on the western portion of the property. So we've just included that and ingrained it in the bylaw to make it clear going forward on the use permissions. So back to the top and what this bylaw specifically does, it establishes a 30 meter setback for all buildings and structures from the shoreline. It establishes a 30 meter setback for all buildings and structures from the provincially significant wetland. So council's aware those are provisions that are uh, ingrained in the bylaw currently. We wanted to just make those abundantly clear through this application. In addition, uh, there's been a provision included that vegetation within 20 meters of the shoreline be maintained in its natural state with the exception of a two meter pathway to the uh, to the shoreline for access on each of the proposed properties. Um, and then item number five, it deals with that accessory storage building, which permits it to be maintained on the, or to exist on the, on the severed lot prior to the establishment of the principal building. And uh, finally, that um, item number six recognizes that existing use in the waterfront landing or mooring facility. And then finally, that site plan control be applied. That's not required to be included in the bylaw, but we've added it uh, at, on the last column of the amendment just to provide clarity that a site plan agreement is required. So that completes my presentation, staff. Um, there's been no comments received in opposition of the proposed application. Again, uh, the lots have been conditionally approved by the Committee of Adjustment, and staff is recommending approval of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, any correspondence in regard to this file? One letter was received from the District of Muskoka stating they would not be opposed to the application of the above noted application providing 
The draft zoning bylaw is revised to prohibit the construction of any new shoreline structures within Toby's Bay provincially significant wetland. And two, the appropriate development control techniques are used to implement the recommendations of the environmental impact study completed by Riverstone Environmental Solutions dated December 2019. Thank you. And to you, Madam Clerk, as well, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to this matter? Yes, the agent Stefan is available on the call. Does he wish to speak at this time or just available for questions? He is in the meeting. If he wishes to speak, he can turn on his microphone. I see, I see a face. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. If I uh, may just make a brief presentation, kindly. Uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and members of the uh, council. My name is Stefan Sherbeck from Planscape Inc. 104 Kimberly Avenue in Bracebridge, P1L 1C6. Um, I'm here today representing the Desjardins family who own um, the subject property. And first of all, um, to start this off, I just want to express my thanks to staff and Mr. Robinson who have assisted us with this project. Um, as mentioned by Mr. Robinson in his thorough presentation, um, everything I've written down, he has uh, appropriately covered. Um, I really have uh, nothing to add with respect to the bylaw in place and his uh, uh, planning analysis. I fully read the staff report. I agree with the detailed policy analysis and I support the recommendations contained in the report in front of you. Again, I've worked with uh, staff to ensure the bylaw in front of you um, that, that Mr. Robinson uh, reviewed this morning contains all the relevant exemptions, as well as the appropriate wording to recognize the current and future uses and any new development on the property. Um, subject to, to the uh, bylaw that was uh, presented with you today, I, I share staff's opinion that the application uh, fully continues to be consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to both the District of Muskoka and Township of Georgian Bay's official plans, and it also represents good planning. Um, I'm also here to answer any questions uh, from you and thank you very much for your time this morning. Muted. There we go. Well, thank you very much. Um, council, if um, I can't see everybody here, I'll try to scroll through. I see Councillor Jarvis's hand up and if anybody else has their hand up, I see Councillor Cooper's hand now. It's, it's hard for it with the scrolling through the screen. So if I miss somebody, please speak up. But Councillor Jarvis, followed by Councillor Cooper, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I remember this from a committee of adjustment. There were some concerns expressed then, and I still have concerns now. Um, I see the Riverstone report, uh, once again, uh, has overheads and photos from 2018. If you looked at Google today, you would see that road to the west was underwater. And in fact, members of Committee of Adjustment, at least one member attempted to uh, access that property via that road uh, earlier this year and could not because it was underwater. Uh, we were advised the Committee of Adjustment that that road was a legal, was a legally existing uh, right of way. Uh, and, and, but I'm still uh, perplexed here that we're allowing a road that is actually underwater right now to exist. Is there no way that we have of um, removing that legally existing right of way uh, on that property because to me it's uh, absurd that we allow a road that's underwater to exist to begin with uh, and uh, that we can't seem to do anything about it. That's my first question. Can somebody uh, give me some answers on that? Mr. Robinson. Your Worship, maybe I can respond through you to the councillor um, as best as I'm able. Um, the existing easement that applies on the property to that road is something that is not subject to first the consent application that was submitted, but secondly, the zoning bylaw amendment application that, that was submitted. So I, I understand the concerns of the councillor, but it's not something that specifically can be dealt with at, at this time or in this meeting. Um, when, when a future develop, dwelling is proposed on the subject lands, uh, they would have to demonstrate adequate access to that dwelling site itself. But as far as, as access to that, uh, that waterfront landing area, that isn't something we consider today. If, um, if they want to modify the road in any sense or move the location of that road, 
because the property is subject to site plan control, there would have to be consideration for that through the site plan process. But simply put, it's not something that's before council and not something that's part of this zoning bylaw amendment. I, I, I accept that. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so, in, can we leave it with the planning department to have this on uh, on the top of their list of things to look at when we get to further down the road on this uh, on this projected property? I suspect that the, any owner of that new development would want access directly off Macy Bay onto the, the buildable area of that property anyway. So I don't see why that road would necessarily be useful to anybody uh, in the future. So uh, I would like to, I would like to see us um, revisit that, uh, that situation sometime later, if, uh, though it has nothing to do with this. Uh, I do have another question. Um, in the Riverstone report, it talks about a number of different monitoring uh, things that should be done uh, during the, uh, any work that gets done on that property. And I'm wondering who would be doing the monitoring and how we assure that that monitoring is done or is it even part of this process? Mr. Um, Robinson. Yes, to your worship, to the counselor. In terms of the monitoring, those monitoring items uh, would be placed in the site plan agreement in terms of the specific requirements and steps to be undertaken and responsibilities. So um, it would be the responsibility of the applicant to just to demonstrate that those monitoring aspects have been completed. So there might be a construction mitigation plan required to demonstrate that um, how the various recommendations of that report are implemented, but they're really implemented through the site plan process. Yeah, they talk about sediment ero and erosion control measures. So I presume, uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. There's a quote in there, inspection of sediment and erosion control measures to be completed within 24 hours of onset of a storm event. I presume then that that's part of the site plan agreement, Jamie? That's right, yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to, I'd be curious to know, I suppose, who determines what a storm event is. Is there a, do we have something in our bylaws about what a storm event is or do we need to depend on the, uh, uh, on the weather department for that? Through your worship, I, I would have to, I don't have the report in front of me, but I'll have to look at the definitions and what's included in that. But that's something we can address through the site plan agreement in terms of what would constitute a storm event, if it's not already defined. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I do have one last question, if it's okay, uh, Mr. Mayor. This time. Uh, just quickly, we've uh, had a number of discussions in the past with planning over um, demarcation of a, a 178 meter high water mark as opposed to the 177.4. Uh, and strictly just for reference purposes, it would be nice to know where that is on this property. Uh, while I have no objections to the, the whole concept of what's going on here, I am concerned because that land is not exactly um, high above uh, the current high water mark. As uh, if you were to look at the Google Maps to uh, Google Earth, you would, you would notice that. I don't think the subject... Um, lands are really to be affected directly, but I am concerned for setbacks. And I'd like, I would have liked to have seen where the 178 mark was on those maps. Is there any way we can get that information? Um, to your worship, we could ask if it's available. Uh, all of the township requires from a bylaw perspective is the 177.4 contour. And then at a building, at a building permit stage, they would have to justify or demonstrate that um, all minimum opening elevations and are above that 178 contour that you're referencing. So yeah, it's 178. Is it 178 or 178 for there, Jamie? Isn't it a meter above the high water mark? Yeah, 178.4, I think, is the number. Yeah. Okay, I, I think we've got to, we'll have to look at this from a planning perspective. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cooper, I believe you were next on my list. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wonder if we could go to the um, site uh, picture where it was showing where the road is. I have a, n a number of questions that are very similar to Councillor Jarvis. I have concerns about uh, some of the um, demarcation and what really is there today. My first comment is that the photographs are from 2018, not 2020. Uh, uh, the water level is considerably different. So I'm talking about slide number five, if you don't mind. Yeah, so first of all, what, it, what is the red line? I can't read any of this, so I'm, 
can you tell me what the red line is? Is that a lot line? That's correct, yeah. That's the lot line based on the parcel fabric, yeah. But it's it's not anywhere close to where the water level is. So it, I'm, I'm not getting why the lot line is different from the high water mark. Uh, that, that's the lot line of the surveyed lot, to my knowledge. Maybe so, Stefan can help answer that. Where's the high water mark then? High water marks, this line here, this cyan colored line. Okay, and what's the black line? This one here? No, the line that's very similar to the high water mark uh, line. This one here? Yes. Stefan, do you have that handy? Yeah, yes, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I believe that's the wetland boundary, the PSW boundary that, that's shown hatched. Oh, right, yeah. Okay, so, so essentially, uh, my concern is uh, about a road that's underwater. Um, and I guess where I'm having some difficulty is not only with that, but also with the uh, requirement uh, for environmental monitoring. I don't know how that can be attached to a site plan agreement. It's never, it, it's, as I understand it, you can't enforce it through a site plan. You're never going to uh, be able to do that if you had to go to LPAT or something like that. So why can't it be part of the bylaw? Uh, through your worship to the councillor, monitoring isn't something under Section 34 that the powers of the Planning Act allow you to control through zoning amendments, which are Section 34. So it is uh, an item that we can include under a site plan agreement, which falls within the requirements of Section 41 of the Planning Act. So that's, that's the reason why. But can the site plan agreement, is it going to be part of the bylaw? Um, up through your worship, a site plan agreement is not part of a zoning bylaw. It's a separate standalone document. Um, and for shoreline residential properties, it's a document that does not typically come back to council for approval. So how do we, can, can the site plan not be required to be part of the, of the bylaw? In other words, the verbiage being in there? Is there some rule in the Planning Act that says you can't do that? I, that's what I want to understand. Your Worship, the Planning Act specifically <laughs> identifies what you can control and what you can regulate through a zoning bylaw passed under Section 34. And the zoning bylaw, or sorry, in the Planning Act also identifies what site plan's role is and what site plan can include, a site plan agreement can include. And you don't typically, you don't include site plan matters under a section 34 bylaw. We have taken the step of saying that the property um, does have to enter into a site plan agreement in the bylaw. That's sort of an, an extra step that you often do not see. There's a separate bylaw that the township has called the site plan control bylaw. That's what prescribes where site plan applies and doesn't apply in the township. And I'm not sure I'm getting the answer to my question. Is there anything in the Planning Act that says that all of these requirements we have that which we have in the site plan cannot be part of the bylaw? Through your worship, there isn't anything that says that it can't be, but there isn't anything that says that it can be. The, the bylaws aren't written in or the Planning Act's not written to say what cannot be included it's written to say what can be included and what its jurisdiction is so i just i think you're um you're looking at it in the sort of the reverse context here so what you're the item you're talking about cannot be included in a section 34 bylaw so the site plan cannot be included that's correct I'm not just talking about the monitoring. I'm also talking about anything else that's in the site plan. I'm trying to understand why we can't have something more, uh, what shall I say, nailed down for all future uses of this property. I, I, I think it's kind of loosey, goosey. Through your worship, the specific uses for this property are prescribed in the zoning bylaw under the SR1 zone with the additional use that's been added 
uh, for the severed lot, which includes the waterfront landing and mooring facility. But beyond that, the specific uses are referenced in the, zone, in the SR1 zone of the bylaw. Um, thank you, uh, Jamie, and uh, I have nothing further. Okay, thank you. Um, any other councillors with their hands up? I'm not seeing any at the moment. So I will ask a couple of questions if I may have you, Mr. Robinson. Um, the first one is, as per the screen that we have in front of us, we can see that I'm gonna say darn close to 95% of the access road to the landing is under water based on the uh, high water mark line that we see on this diagram. Is there anything that through this bylaw and through our regulations that would prevent or um, the uh, owner of this property from building an alternative road or laneway or access lane, whatever term you want to use on it. Um, because I imagine that uh, the vehicles are driving through the water at this time or driving through, literally driving through in a portion of that road, the provincially sensitive wetland. Um, Your Worship, there's nothing preventing them from doing that. The property is going to be placed under site plan control. So if there's a new road location that's identified in the future, um, that would become part of the new site plan agreement. But there's nothing preventing them from establishing a new driveway. The other question I have is that um, I did note in your modified report that you're referring to the 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 access road and the landing as for one uh, water access lot. Um, but I don't think I read that in the bylaw. And, and my concern is, do we have any protection from the property owner deciding that this could be an access point for three, four, 10 lots as opposed to just one? Yeah, Your Worship, it is actually included in the bylaw. It's in the fifth column of the bylaw. Maybe so there's I six it. columns in the bylaw, but the fifth column identifies that it's for one water access property. And then the sixth column provides the definition for what that waterfront landing mooring facility is. So it is included. Um, I'm not sure where I see that, if you wouldn't mind pointing that out to me. Yep, just one second here. Because I'm, I'm just seeing, uh, what I'm looking at is page two of four of the bylaw or page 99 of our report. Sorry, just my, I just need to pull it up here in one second. So right here under item five, your worship. The waterfront landing mooring facility shall be for the use of a maximum of one water access lot. Okay. Um, uh, that, that I did see, did not see that on the copy that I reviewed um, that was sent out with the um, with the package. Yeah, I'm looking at our notes, Mr. Mayor, and I'm finding, I don't, I'm not finding that as well. I don't see that in the, what we've been given. Okay. So 
in other words, you've improved the bylaw since the package was sent out last week for our review. It may have been, yes. Okay. It like it has been. I, I, I like your answer. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, Councillor Jarvis, you want to rejoin the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. I just, sorry. Just continuing on from your comments. I was, I guess I was trying to make heads and tails of that landing. I'm just going to harp on that landing again. It talks about it being uh, for uh, water access properties. This landing being, for being there for somebody other than the property owner that we're talking about right here? Yeah, your wor uh, through your worship. So I'll just go back to this. So um, this, this waterfront landing is currently used for uh, a property owner that has an island nearby. And maybe I'll let the applicant's planner provide a bit more information on that. Yeah, appreciate that. Yes, uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the answer is yes. It is uh, a legally existing um, waterfront access that's been used for, for many, many years and um, recently uh, supported through that court order. Um, and it specifically relates to one property um, a short distance away. I know that the owner of the island um, typically uses this, uh, uses a kayak canoe to get back and forth. Um, no motorized vehicles, etc., or motorized boats. It's, it's uh, a very short paddle from the island to the specific property. I, I would contend that he's been kayaking not from that landing then, he's been kayaking from the road because uh, the, the main, the Macy Bay Road, because the road access road has been underwater. You can't get a vehicle along that road. I, I know that for a fact. Uh, during high water, if you looked at the Google Earth today, you would see that road is underwater, period. The high water mark is beyond that road. There's no way that that road could be used unless he's got a four wheel drive, possibly with a snorkel uh, to get to that landing. So I still don't understand all this. How do we, again, Jamie, I know this is not even part of this in a way, but it is in another way because we're granting somebody access to island property, looks like via this bylaw, which I don't think is something we should be looking at. So through your worship, just to be clear, we're not granting anybody anything that they don't already have permission for. It's simply recognizing a historic use that, as Mr. Serbak has mentioned, is a legally exa existing use. So, um, and, and the reason it's included in the bylaw is because we're, we're reconfiguring the lots. So to make it sort of crystal clear going forward about what the use permissions are on that property, we've included it in the bylaw. Okay, so I'll just make one last comment then, Jamie. In the future, uh, outside of what we're doing here today, can we look at addressing the, the issue of that uh, legal, legal right of way? Because to me, it doesn't make any sense. I, I will make one comment, Mr. Jarvis, or Councillor Jarvis, if, if I may. I drove past this site probably a couple of weeks ago. And at that point, there actually was a vehicle parked on that right of way within sight of Macy Bay Road. So it could easily have been, and I'm speculating now, yeah. um, that it might have been the island owner who actually drove only slightly down that road and then put the, launched the kayak because he couldn't go any further, but it, yeah. he was still using it for access. Again, that's speculation, but I could imagine that possibility because where, where this lane goes off Macy Bay Road is above water. Right, yes, no, I'll acknowledge that. Um, but my, my con let me just double down a bit here on this. The, a road implies road usage. Road usage means a vehicle means a carbon producing or carbon using um, vehicle of some sort. It means stuff on the road that will be not, uh, will be detrimental to the wetland as just generally speaking. And if we have a road that's now submerged and is now at basically wetland part of toby's bay because it's underwater what can we in the future address uh getting this island owner different access to his property while at the same time uh addressing this uh legal right of way again it's outside of this i know that but i'm just no. i would like some reassurance so we can relook at it mr robinson can you put that on your list of homework and uh, and mr zirbach 
Yeah, I'll just say it's usually something we're not going to go out as a municipality and look at unless there's some improvements proposed, for example. We don't specific, but um, I can speak with the with uh, Mr. Serbak and see if we can come up with if there's any action that needs to be taken. And, and if, if I may, um, Mr. Mayor, through you, um, knowing the user of the property, um, the, the easement itself is for vehicular and pedestrian traffic. Um, I know for a fact that they are, uh, it, it, they have strong environmental um, roots and they're not at all interested in driving through a, a, a flooded area. If it means they park at the road at the top, um, as noted, because they canoe and kayak, it just means they have to do a few more paddles to get out to, to the end of uh, the property. And also, uh, you know, again, the, the, the island user is also um, very closely associated with the owners of the property here. If for whatever you know, reason they need to use the other dock or the access point, there are some mutual obligations and, and requirements that, that will establish that. So I, I know, again, through, through my discussions with um, uh, the owners that um, the wetland is important. They're not at all interested in, in, in driving a car that's going to have impacts to this uh, feature. Okay. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to comment a, a couple of things. One is that uh, uh, there may be a certain degree of interest in the environment by the current owners and both properties that we're referring to. Doesn't mean it's going to be that, that way in the future. Ownership changes. So I, I think there's still some issues around this property. I have another question about um, the uh, landing and the use of, is there anything in our verbiage that talks about non-motorized vessels versus motorized? Because this is a wetland again. So one wonders, uh, the new owner of an island might come in with their 40-foot uh, boat. Through your worship, there's nothing about that. There's no control over that in the Planning Act. And just to be be clear, we've talked about a number, and this isn't to Councillor Cooper's comment specifically, but the purpose of the amendment today that's before Council is dealing with the setbacks that are being proposed. So the 30 meter setback, the 20 meter vegetation area, and the, and the, the confirmation of that accessory building to be allowed on the severed lot prior to um, the establishment of a principal building. So I just wanna make sure that those are the principal issues to be considered through this zoning bylaw amendment that we're not losing sight of that and, and getting caught up in other things that aren't sort of particularly relevant in this instance. But, but no, there's nothing we can do about how, whether it's a motorized vehicle or a motorized boat or not a motorized boat. Thank you, Councillor Cooper followed by Councillor Hazelton. Uh, yes, thank you. And I guess my comment is that uh, since I, I understand what we're looking at today, I'm not understanding where this is going to be nailed down at some future time. I'm not getting any confidence of that. So that's why I have concerns about the road, about the, the type of uh, uh, access, d uh, dock, and a wetland, all those things. When and, when and how is it going to be dealt with? So I, I can't support this as it stands right now. Thank you. Councillor Hazelton, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, I have a, a question and a comment. So we'll start off with the question. And the question is, we've heard a couple of times about some court order uh, requiring uh, right of access across the uh, that roadway on the north uh, west side. I'm wondering, what is the relevance of that? Uh, is there any any more information that is important for us to understand about that? Or 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 and why is there some court order? Uh, dictating that. Through your worship, uh, I just found out about this court order uh, late last night from the applicant's planner, so maybe you can provide some information, but my understanding is it relates to the access that's uh, provided to that waterfront property and specifically the landing. Thank you. Through, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the court order essentially legally established this long-standing easement over the property. It's been there for, for many, many years. Um, I will note that when I did attend the property, um, albeit um, probably over a year ago, 
Um, I was able to drive right down to the end. I know that the water levels fluctuate on a, on a regular basis. Um, and essentially, I understand that the wording in the court order cannot be changed, nor can a, 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 a zoning bylaw um, compound this, this legal uh, court order. Um, I understand that this has been presented to, uh, to a counselor in, in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this, it's registered on title and there's a list of conditions that are required through that court order. Um, again, it, it's, it's uh, an order between the previous owner of the subject lands and the current owner of that island property. So there was um, uh, you know, some questions back then and that's why they proceeded to the court to clarify what was specifically required in the conditions for usage of this existing um, easement. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Mayor, may I make a comment here? You may. Um, so based on what I'm hearing, um, first of all, I, I, I did want to comment on the, uh, the work of the uh, planning company and the EIS um, study that was done. Uh, both seem to be very comprehensive. And when we look at a diagram like this, I'm seeing way more information than we normally see. So I want to applaud the uh, the people who put this recommendation forward. I think the concerns that I'm hearing from fellow fellow councillors uh, is related to things that are really uh, beyond our ability to control. Um, and we may say, you know, that that's uh, sadly something that we might want to look at in the future. Um, but it looks like the um, uh, the owners and the applicants here have um, done the work that they felt they needed to do to uh, pin things down um, and what we're left with to uh, approve or not approve is um, uh, things such as uh, the severance of building lot area and so on um, and based on uh, other uh, examples that we are seeing in the Honey Harbor area uh, based on the fact that um, we have a few things in this proposal that we may not like, but uh, are really outside of our, our jurisdiction. They've been locked down for the courts. Um, I'm okay with it and uh, would support it. Thank you. I apologize. I was muted. Councillor Bocek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just wondering if we would be having this conversation if this was to have come before us between 1985 and 2019, um, when there when there was no uh, water that's above the high water mark. Matter of fact, it was it was below for 35 years. So, uh, my question is going to be to Jamie on this one. Uh, reviewing this file and, and knowing that we're looking at setbacks and this driveway easement is close to a, a provincially significant wetlands. Um, in a normal course of action, say in 2010, one would just bring in shot rock and lay, raise that road up two feet. Uh, not gonna be an issue. Um, so the question is site alteration within the setbacks of a provincially significant wetlands. Is that something that can be done on this property? Um, it, because I know before this year, that driveway probably could have been raised. So this water issue would not be a problem. And chances are in the next 35 years, the high water is not gonna be an issue if it starts to recede and goes down. So this is a, in my lifetime, a two off situation where the water has been this high. Do we restrict uh, somebody from using their property because of two events that happened over the past 60 years. Um, so we'll go back to my original question. Could this easement, this uh, laneway or roadway uh, be raised uh, due to the proximity that it has to the provincially significant wetlands? Thank you. Through your worship to the councillor, the township does have a site alteration bylaw that applies to shoreline areas within front yards, as well as to lands that are zoned environmentally protection that does not permit site alteration. 
I think just big picture, uh, the applicant's planner outlined sort of how this, this driveway gets used and has been used historically. In times of low water, they travel to the end where the dock is, launch their boat and get access. In times of high water, they go as far as they can, put the boat in the water and, and get access. So uh, I don't foresee any changes. And if there are changes that are required uh, to that existing road, they would have to seek uh, approval to do so. And thank you for that, Jamie. I think uh, that explains quite a bit. Um, this is Honey Harbor. This is Georgian Bay. We do get rush up, roll up, uh, a, a lot of different conditions, a lot of different years. So um, it's unique and we have to deal with uniqueness of this council because um, it's an ever-changing environment here. And I don't think there's a, a carte blanche. I don't think there's a a script that tells us what to do in these situations. It's up to the individuals, but um, I see for a year or two that the water is high. There's no reason to impede somebody from launching a canoe or a kayak halfway down that driveway and traveling. Um, denying access to a piece of property off a municipal road is not something I'm going to want to entertain. Um, and common sense prevails here. I don't think it needs to be legislated by us. So uh, I'm in favor of the application. Um, I, I'm going to try to, I want to end the conversation on this access lane. I think we've gone on far too long, given that it's not what's in front of us. And given that there is a, uh, an e a registered easement supported by a court order that an individual can use whatever portion of this lane they wish to use to access their island property. And I don't, we can't change that. And that's actually not what's in front of us. What's in front of us is the report that wants to uh, have us ch make an uh, amendment to the zoning bylaw to allow this property to be split and to have certain additional conditions put on the um, new property. And we have at this point our, a choice of either we send this back to staff for a subsequent council meeting or that we can approve it today. So if we're going to approve it to Councillor Jarvis. I'm going to find my mouse here. Um, I, I think I've, I've got some reassurance here that we can, uh, you know, we can look at the, uh, the issue over that right of way uh, in, in, in another entirely separate um, uh, uh, meeting. And I think uh, I'm agreeing with you and that we're dealing with something that's outside of this. So we should be uh, giving these guys the okay to move ahead. My mouth isn't working. Councillor Cooper. Yeah, just briefly, um, you know, I, I understand what you've uh, stated, Mayor, and I, I, I think I concur with it. I would like to point out that uh, high water levels on Georgian Bay are not a 35-year event. If you look at the historical <laughs> charts, uh, high water has uh, been going on for 150 years, and, and uh, the, the typical swings in water level are not a long period of low that we had um, up to 2013 and a little bit after, but actually seven years up, seven years down is the typical thing. So we've had a lot of high water um, over the years. So just uh, so that our, our councillors understand what goes on in coastal Georgia Bay. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to if, if we were to approve it today, the resolution would be, be it resolved that council receives report 2020-74 and enact bylaw 2020-092 being a zoning bylaw amendment for 201 Macy Bay Road. We're all prepared to vote. All those in favor. One, two, three, four, five, six. All six of us have approved after lengthy and sometimes interesting discussion. Thank okay. you, Council. I appreciate it. I will pass along those important comments to the, uh, to the neighbors. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Next in front of us, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Z20-09 for Bylaw 2020-091 daily, 8 Island 3810 Georgian Bay Road to our planning department. Mr. Robinson, this is you again, I believe. 
Yep, just one second here. I'm just getting my screen sharing set up. Okay. I also believe this is this is another situation where it went in front of the Committee of Adjustment uh, prior to it coming in front of us. That is correct, yes. So this is an application, again, uh, provisional consent was granted to create a lot in the Wawa Tacy community from an existing lot of record. The proposed amendment would establish a site-specific lot frontage and an increased front yard setback. The lot did not meet the required minimum lot frontage outlined in the zoning bylaw, and that's the need for the, uh, for the amendment. So the subject property is located in Wawa Tacy here. I'll see if I can just make this a little larger. You can see Indian Harbor in, in this area and uh, the various, some of the various islands that, that you may or may not be familiar with. But here's the location of the subject property. The applicant's name is, uh, is Dali. And this application was submitted by Applet and Warbeck Surveying and Cole Rakes from, from that company. So just outlining the, the severed and, and retained lands, the subject lands, uh, in terms of lot frontage, how it's measured, lot frontage is on a lot such as this would be uh, the retained lands, it would be measured along this red line here. And on the severed lot, it would be measured along this line here. In terms of the actual frontage, as we go along the shoreline, it's quite substantial on this property. And that, that's the reason from a big picture perspective why um, staff supported the consent application on the basis of not it not meeting the required minimum lot frontage was that the, the sort of impact frontage, if you will, or the shoreline frontage was uh, was fairly substantial in terms of uh, its comparison to the actual bylaw frontage and how it's measured. So we've got the retained lot here, which the retained lot includes part one and part two, which is this piece here. And then the severed land here is, is part three of the reference plan. The retained lot includes the existing cottage and the existing boathouse in this area. There's also a dock location up here the long-term vision for this site would be that they will come in at some point when they decide to proceed and develop this property with a dwelling with a lot addition application to add part two to part three so that this boathouse would actually become part of this property. So this would be the main entrance or location for access for the severed lot and this would be the main access location for the retained lot. They have identified a potential docking location in this area for the purposes of creating this lot at this time. But again, what this application is really focused on is the, the lot frontage, so it's less than what's required by the zoning bylaw. And what the policies in the Wawa Tacy portion of the official plan indicate is that where you're considering reduced lot frontages, you should consider other modifications to the bylaw, such as increased setbacks. So what's being proposed here, instead of the required 20 meter setback for the front yard for dwellings would be a 25 meter setback. So that's the sort of basis for the applications. It's just an aerial imagery of the property. So as you can see, the existing boathouse location and dock location currently that service the lot, those would both be part of the retained lot with this boathouse and area uh, to be transferred to the severed lot through that addition of part two in the future. And this here is the location of a potential docking location for the severed lot. Here's an aerial imagery. This is sort of near where the dwelling location is looking out towards Georgian Bay. You can see there's sort of a minimal amount of vegetation that exists uh, in the area of the property. This is the dock that was identified. So the more northerly dock, the boathouse is located sort of to the right of this picture, but you can see it's a, it's a small harbor. And these photos were taken in uh, June, 2019 by Mr. Rakes. 
Here's a picture of the existing cottage on the property. So looking out towards the bay from the existing cottage. And then just in terms of the set, this bylaw specifics, what was being required. And you'll note in the bylaw that was included in the agenda package, this 25 meter setback was not included. That's been added. It is referenced throughout the staff report. And then the minimum law frontage requirement of 180 meters that would apply to the lots. So uh, staff have reviewed the proposed application in light of the PPS, in light of the district plan and the, and the township official plan, and uh, specifically the policies that have pertain to Wawatasi and its staff's opinion that the proposed uh, amendments should be, should be granted. And they help again, facilitate that provisional consent that's all already been issued by the, uh, that's already been issued by the committee of adjustment. So that completes my presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Um, to our clerk, have we received any correspondence on this file? One letter of no objection was received from the District of Muskoka. Thank you. And, and further, Madam Clerk, are, is there anyone, any members of the public who wish to speak to this? Uh, Cole Riggies, the agent for the owners is in the meeting. I can't see Mr. Rakes. Mr. I, uh, do you wish to speak to this matter? I'm just here to answer any questions that you or the council may have. Jamie has summarized the application quite well. So again, I'm just here to answer any questions. I was there personally on the site and oversee the whole plan being generated and all the applications that were submitted. I attended the meeting that was in August for the committee of adjustment meeting that was approved on the condition of this application being successfully submitted as well. So again, I'm just here for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, any member of council wish to, I see Councillor Cooper's hand and I see followed by Councillor Jarvis. Councillor Cooper. Just a couple of quick questions. I, I really don't have any issues with this, but uh, the red line, is that the 25 meter setback? Either to you, uh, Cole, or Jamie. So that's the 20 meter setback for the, the building envelope. That was, this is the sketch that was submitted for the committee of adjustment, um, the consent application. So it hasn't been updated to reflect the proposed 25 meter setback. And, and just to add to that on the severed lot, the, the building envelope, the 20 meter setback is this first line the 30 meter setback for the septic system is the second line. So your 25 meter building setback would be right in the middle of those two. And I see that the proposed building is mostly within the 30 meter setback. So just to continue, if I may, Mayor. Yeah, so, so thank you for that clarification. And I have been on this property and I, I just observed that on the severed land and frankly on the retained lands, um, the land is pretty high relative to the, even our current water level. We can see the 177.4, it may be moving a little bit, but I just sort of observe that, uh, that the shoreline tends to go up fairly steeply in most parts of this uh, property. So uh, I don't see a contour per se, but uh, uh, just wanted to comment that the land's fairly flat and quite high. So I think it's uh, uh, certainly very, um, uh, appropriate that there might be a, a severance here and uh, I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jarvis. It, it, it lists in, the, in, the two, in a couple of reports that there is no uh, correspondence. My understanding uh, through Committee of Adjustment was that there was support for this from the uh, Wawa Tasi Association. Is, am I correct on that or am I uh, dreaming? You are not dreaming. I heard the same thing at the Committee of Adjustment. I think it was part of the report. But it's not in part of the report. The reports here are saying there's no correspondence. And I'm a little concerned because I think it's really important that that support uh, from the Wawa Tasi Association be included as part of this. I have no objections, by the way. I just, I just said we need that. 
I, I mean, I, I, all I can tell you is I know I read somewhere that it was part of the report. I, I think the confusion may have been the application. Um, the the comments were made as part of the to the committee of adjustment as part of that notice, but not part of the notice that went out for the zoning bylaw amendment. So that's likely the reason that it wasn't referred to here. But nonetheless, the comments supported both the consent application and the bylaw amendment. Anyone else have their hand? Councilor Rianco. Jamie, um, we're, we're supporting the, the severance today for part three. And you indicated earlier that someplace along the line, part two is going to be added to this part three area. What are we approving today? And if we're only approving the severance for part three, does it come back to us or to the Committee of Adjustment for uh, addition to, uh, of part two to this? How does all that work? So through you to the councillor, today the severance has already been provisionally approved by the Committee of Adjustment. You're only being asked today to consider A, increasing the setback from the required 20 meters up to 25, so an increased setback, and a decrease in the required in the permitted lot, uh, lot frontage to 180 meters for both lots. That's what you're being asked today. The reason that part two and the boathouse were included with the retained lands when it went to the committee of adjustment is back to this, the bylaw requirement that you can't have an accessory building on a property before you have a principal building. So that's the reason the, uh, the, the goal and the end goal would be that this boathouse would become part of this lot, but because we couldn't create a, or because the applicant couldn't create a lot and township staff couldn't support a lot, that had an accessory building on the severed land. That's the reason part two got it included now. So, and the reason that Mr. Rakes identified it as part one, two, and three is it'll make it really easy when they come back to committee of adjustment in the future to do this lot addition because the reference plan has already been prepared. If I may, uh, Mr. Robinson, subsequent to that, what you said we couldn't do, didn't we do exactly that in the prior case? We approved a lot severance with a, only a uh, accessory building. I'm just wondering if we're not making ourselves more work here. Uh, through your work, to your worship, um, that's correct. We did do it. Different situation here is that the concern is we're dealing with uh, a water access structure in this case. So a dock or a boathouse, we'll put them in the same category. So you'd be sort of inviting, and it's a water access property as opposed to the previous situation was a road access property. So you, by including part two in the severed lands now with the boathouse as the principal accessory building, I think there'd it'd be setting a very dangerous precedent in the municipality of allowing an accessory access structure to a vacant waterfront property, which is something that has not historically been proper, been supported I, and could lead to sort of like your camping type situation, that sort of thing, which- I think that's an excellent response. Thank you. Any other councillors with their hands raised? Councillor Hazelton. Thank you. Um, not uh, to um, conflict with what we just heard, but um, I can guarantee you in Honey Harbor, there are many, many examples where docks and accessory buildings have been permitted prior to a principal residence on the property. And um, uh, I, in, based on what we're seeing here, um, it, we're gonna force this guy to come back here uh, and put part two to part three later on. Uh, and I personally don't see a reason for that with all the other examples uh, that we have specifically in Honey Harbor. I don't know what's like up the shoreline, but I can guarantee you there are examples and I have two right off the top of my head where we have approved these things uh, uh, as a township uh, in Honey Harbor, uh, docks and accessory buildings before building the main building. So uh, it's not a precedent. And um, uh, I don't have a problem in, in this case, uh, assuming other councillors would be supportive. I don't have a problem with uh, allowing this to go ahead with part two attached to part three. Thank you. Um, Councilor Hazelin, I just want to make one quick response, is, and I, I don't know of all the examples you're thinking of, but I'm aware of a couple of examples where a dock was permitted because a building permit had been issued for the main structure. 
Councilor Cooper. I like the way this has been set up because what we're trying to avoid here are uh, yachting out stations, essentially. We've had, we had a problem and I think our bylaws read differently now to, to force what is happening here for that reason. Uh, and and uh, we've had a number of issues in the past, certainly in, uh, I, I don't know so much about in Honey Harbor, but I, I, I do know that the, on my boat trip north from through Honey Harbor, I see uh, properties where there's several uh, yachts, live aboard yachts tied up to one property, multiple owners. And so those, maybe we have allowed it in the past. I think there's a reason to do what we're doing here. So I support the way this is established here. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and to the best of my knowledge, further to that, if I may, is that my understanding is they're not prepared, they, they, that being the applicants, they don't know when the new building may be built. It could be well into the future. And therefore, you know, it's not, I don't know, I think that uh, I, I fully, personally fully support what's going on. Um, the resolution in front of me, because I think so far we've had fairly positive response, would be moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Hazelton. Be it resolved that Council receives report 2020-75 and that Council enact bylaw 2020-091 being a zoning bylaw amendment for 8 Island 3810 Georgian Bay Road. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. That is carried unanimously. And thank you very much for that. All right. Oh, I'm just, uh, um, count, oh, sorry, uh, Madam Clerk, I did notice now in retrospect on the last motion, it was moved by Councillor Douglas, though she wasn't present. So I think we have to replace the mover on the prior motion. I apologize to Council for not noticing this earlier. Um, we did pass it unanimously, but I think we should change the mover. Will you take care of that for us? And Councillor Jarvis is volunteering to be the mover. I can just sense it. So I'm replacing Douglas with Jarvis. Thank you very much, Councillor Jarvis. And we're now going to, if I don't lose my paperwork, move on to the next item. And this is Zoning Bylaw Amendment Z20-18, Bylaw 2020-090, Housekeeping, Kings Farm Road. I see Ms. Lemieux, so I presume you're the planning department representative at this time. I am, good morning. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so the next application in front of council this morning is application Z20-18, uh, which is relating to a property located on Kings Farm Road. So the purpose and effect of this amendment is to provide a correction to a portion of Schedule A, map number 140, to recognize a previous site-specific bylaw that was passed uh, relating to the lands um, in question today. And I will show you some, uh, some images moving forward. Uh, so essentially what this application will allow staff to do is to make a correction on the map to ensure that it um, states open space zone as it was supposed to be rezoned um, on the mapping back in 2013, but it was um, unfortunately missed when the new uh, zoning bylaw came into place in 2014. So here you can see the location of the subject lands. So back in 2012, 2013, uh, the subject lands were part of Planning Act approval applications that essentially created three new parcels of land, as you can see down here. Um, along the shore for the purpose of uh, recreational residential properties. And the lands uh, located here in black is essentially what was considered the retained lands at that time. And the purpose of bylaw 2013-80 um, was to rezone these, uh, these retained lands to open space to ensure that no future development occurred. So here we have just an aerial uh, photo of the property as you can see here. So this is the lands here the retained, and then these were the lots that were created through those applications. So here is just a quick uh, uh, excerpt from the, um, the zoning mapping as it stands right now. Um, and as you can see here, um, 
it is identified SR1, this portion of the lands where this is what would be rezoned, i.e. on the schedules, uh, to open space to reflect the previous decision. And these lots here would uh, remain in the SR1 zone. And here's an excerpt from that bylaw from 2013 that um, some members of council may actually remember um, it coming back to them for approval. So as you can see here, this hatched area, which is that retained lands, was supposed to be um, rezoned to open space, but again, just essentially fixing a mapping error here that um, just did not get carried forward. So uh, the effect of this bylaw that is in front of council uh, this morning is to essentially just allow staff to correct that error on the uh, mapping schedule um, to make sure that everything um, is correctly identified uh, in our zoning maps. So uh, if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to assist. And I do believe that there are a number of people in the public who wish to speak to council as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, any correspondence? One letter of note Jackson, was received from the District of Muskoka and one letter was received from Mike Mattis on behalf of the Glasgow Cottages Road Alliance stating any new lots created at the south end of King's Farm Road will not have legal access over the portion of the road that is owned by GCRAI until a share has been purchased. Thank you, but uh, I just want a correction or a correction, a clarification from our planner. We are not creating any new lot with this, what's in front of us today, are we? Correct. I believe the Roto Association was essentially commenting that if council did not approve this correction, it was still an SR1 zone. And if future development happened on that lot, that they would not support them being part of the Road Association. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I understand, Madam Clerk, that we have members of the public because I see some extra names on my screen. Correct. Um, do the owners of the property in question wish to speak to this matter? I believe that's Linda and Doug Coburn. We actually, we actually have a representative online uh, by the name of Win Wayne Simpson who will speak on our behalf. Okay, thank you. Mr. Simpson. Really at the present time, um, uh, hopefully <clears throat> I can uh, get that up and running again, but um, I'm here uh, representing uh, the uh, Coburn family. Um, the property is jointly owned by Peter Coburn and, uh, and his brother, the late Bruce Coburn. Uh, also as attendees uh, joining the meeting, I believe are uh, is, um, Bruce's son, Doug, and his, his spouse, Linda and possibly Nancy, uh, uh, Bruce, uh, Doug's sister. Um, so they've asked me to speak to the bylaw on their behalf. Um, th as the uh, planners pointed out, there's about a, a 70 acre property that's owned uh, by the family. Uh, it does have uh, shoreline uh, access. It is, a, it is a shoreline lot with a lot of backland. Um, the uh, family wants to oppose the uh, bylaw to the extent that it uh, rezones, purports to rezone the shoreline portion of the property uh, from shoreline residential to open space. Um, and, uh, but the family would not be in, in a, opposed to rezoning the backlands, uh, the lands north of uh, Kings Farm Road uh, to, uh, to an open space for environmental protection. Um, we can't, I appreciate the history of the property to some extent, although I wasn't involved at the time, going back to 20, 2012, 2013. Um, but I would like to say uh, to the committee right now that there's no sound planning rationale to change the, the zoning on the shoreline portion of the property. Um, if I could ask uh, uh, Victoria to do me a favor by um, uh, showing the committee members uh, the staff report number 100-11. And give me a moment. I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, Hopefully, everybody can see that. Can you see that, Wayne? Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'm really happy. Oh, there I go. I finally clicked something and it worked. Thank you very much. Um, the um, I can actually start my video, maybe. 
Okay, so this is a staff report that was prepared in November of 2011 by uh, Todd Weatherall, a planner with the township uh, at the time and also signed uh, uh, with concurrence from Carolyn Tripp, uh, a registered professional planner, and then uh, I believe either the head of the planning department or CAO at the time. Uh, what it does show initially was that there were four zoning or four severed lots proposed plus one retained lot. Um, the, the lot that we're speaking of now in terms of the shoreline uh, would be shown as severed lot B32-11. So it's the, it's the fourth lot in terms of the, the applications. And, uh, and then there was proposed a uh, retained lot, which would be everything beyond uh, the Kings Road, Farm Road North. Um, and if I could refer, refer you to uh, the next page, I believe uh, there is a, um, there's a statement under uh, item six, no, under five, I should say, uh, the last statement there, the retained land is vacant and if the application is approved as, as recommended, it is recommended that the retained lands be rezoned to an open space zoning to limit the potential for a residential building to be constructed on the back lot. So again, going back to the first page, there was a proposal for four waterfront residential lots and a back lot. And the recommendation was that the back lot be, be zoned uh, so as to preclude it not being, you know, not being built on as a, as a residential lot. The, um, and if I could go to the next page, Victoria, thank you. Uh, the, these are uh, the, the committee, the recommendations of the planners and the last recommendation number five is that the applicant apply to the township to rezone the proposed lots to shoreline residential type one and the back lot to an open space zone. And, and that in my mind makes perfect sense that the, the shoreline lots would be shoreline residential and that the back lands would be zoned uh, open space. Um, Victoria, if I could ask you to bring up uh, the uh, report number 67-12. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, under number one, the recommendations, uh, item five is the, the applicant is to apply to the township to rezone the lands to a residential zone and to protect constraint areas identified in the environmental impact study that was completed by Asmith Environmental Consulting. And if we could go to the next page under item four, uh, the last sentence there is an environmental impact study has been completed, which identifies suitable building locations, dock locations and walking paths. And uh, Victoria, if I could ask you then to bring up the extract from the Azimuth report that I sent you. Okay. Uh, so this is the report that was done by Azimuth's environmental consulting in August, 2012. Um, and um, on the first page and highlighted, it, it says that the EIS, um, addresses the potential impacts associated with the proposed severances and associated development. Um, at that time, it was then, by that time, it was proposed that there would be three severed lots and one retained. And I can only draw the conclusion that uh, the purpose of that was so that a back lot uh, divorced from the shoreline would not be created, but that the, uh, that the back lot lands would be continued to be tied to the shoreline and thus, Application B32-11, uh, the fourth set consent application was withdrawn and uh, no decision was made on that uh, at the Committee of Adjustment. Uh, the middle of the report goes on to say that uh, the EIS um, assesses the potential presence of key sensitive natural features associated with proposed severance areas. Suitable building envelopes, access routes, dock locations are identified within each severed, severance area, which avoids the key sensitive habitat features. It goes on to say in the bottom, the assessment provides the last paragraph, uh, an overview of the existing hydrogeological conditions across the entire site as it pertains to the suitability of the property for up to four potential family cottages and on the next page uh, under 
item nine. Thank you, Victoria. If I, if I was somewhat, you know, computer literate, I could probably do this, but I don't know how to do all this stuff. So bear with me. So the uh, num number nine says the propose, proposed severance will establish lots for the construction of four seasonal cottages within development envelopes located outside the environmental constraint areas as uh, outlined on figure three. And uh, the impact assessment has been given full consideration of the habitat requirements of species at risk, uh, assumed and documented to occur in the area and results indicate that the placement of these developments within the proposed building envelopes will not result in negative direct or indirect impacts to habitat of endangered or threatened species consistent with the ESA and the provincial policy statement. Uh, and, the, and then number 10 goes on to say the proposed lot severances and potential cottage dock sites will not result in a negative impact or harmful alteration, uh, disruption or destruction on fish habitat and overall productivity of the existing fisheries in the surrounding Little Go Home Bay. Um, so the, the last conclusion was the proposed development will not degrade the health or integrity of the ecological functions of significant habitat of endangered threatened species, significant wildlife habitat, or fish habitat as a result of direct or indirect impacts associated with the proposed works in keeping with the PPS and the ESA. And then if I could just refer to, to the figure three or figure two in this instance, instance uh, the committee members will, can see that um, shown on the property, uh, albeit faintly at the scale, but shown on the property of the four residential lots that were ultimately, uh, ultimately created, uh, three are you know, smaller lots that are shoreline uh, lots. And then the fourth one is really the, the shoreline access for the larger retained portion. Um, when this was, when this uh, map had been prepared, there was initially a proposal for a severed lot, retained lot, severed lot, retained lot. Uh, but ultimately there were three severed lots on the west, uh, to the west of the retained lot. And on each of those, you can see uh, that the consultants have identified areas of constraint and uh, the, the uh, proposed building envelopes uh, and uh, walkways down to shoreline structures. Uh, and included in, on the schedule uh, on the far right-hand side is uh, the proposed severed portion. At that time, it was uh, 0 0.6 hectares, so 1.7 acres. Uh, and that was, uh, that's the property that is currently zoned shoreline residential together with the other three lots. Um, and in looking at it now, I, I, with all this due respect, this is not a criticism of, uh, of uh, Victoria in any way, shape or form. I, I thoroughly respect how, how this matter got back before the community. Um, but the bylaw that was passed in 2013 um, was a bylaw to amend the comprehensive bylaw at that time, which was bylaw 91-19. Um, then in 2014, the municipality passed uh, bylaw 2014-75, I believe that's the number. And, uh, and the new comprehensive bylaw rescinded the previous bylaws. So 90, bylaw 91-19, as it was amended by uh, the bylaw that was site specific to this property were, was rescinded. So, so in terms of the zoning, officially the zoning, uh, the current zoning on the property is the current zoning. It's, it's, it's lawful and uh, it's uh, fully in effect. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily characterize this as a housekeeping bylaw, but I do understand um, how, uh, how it got to be called that, and I'm not disputing that. I think uh, the important thing is to recognize that initially there was, the intention was at all times that there would be four waterfront lots, the fourth lot, uh, and they could, they could all be developed by seasonal cottages. The fourth lot would also include the retained lands, which are on the north side of uh, the roadway, and that there should be no development on the north side of the roadway, and so, the zoning bylaw, the current zoning bylaw, uh, as proposed, uh, it, it would be a proper to zone the lands on the north side, open space or environmental protection to implement the recommendations in the azimuth report. 
But beyond that, there's no nothing in the azimuth report and there's no planning, solid planning rationale that I can establish that would say that the shoreline lot that's being that continues to be held by the family should uh, should have the zoning change from shoreline residential one to open space, which would effectively preclude all development on their lands and would necessitate an application for a zoning bylaw amendment to to reverse you know the, that matter to change the open space back to shoreline residential one, and I think that sort of application would be uh, uh, you know would meet with every success. So we would ask that the committee uh, recommend uh, or uh, passing the bylaw, but maintaining the shoreline residential zoning on that part of the retained lots or the subject property um, uh, lying south of uh, Kings Farm Road. And uh, so we respectfully ask the committee to consider that. And again, uh, some of the family members are, uh, I believe, attendees, and they can possibly answer any questions the committee have that would be directed to family members. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I, I see um, at least two other names below or and oh and th I see faces is there any other members of the public who wish to comment on this application I see Ms. Coburn are, um, are you wishing to comment no or you're you're, you're accepting what we've heard so far okay um Ms. Graydon uh I don't know if it's Miss or Ms. Mr. Ray uh are either you wanting to make any comments Okay, Pat Graydon, I got a no. So we'll, we'll, we'll go on the assumption now that we'll turn this over to council and, and we'll ask council if anybody has any comments or questions in this regard, in regard to this file. Uh, I see Councillor Cooper followed by Councillor Bocek. I'm just looking for, uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm just looking for a clarification from our uh, planning manager um, as I understand it, this is a housekeeping bylaw that we're looking at here, um, but it sounds like our, uh, the planner Simpson is asking for more than a housekeeping bylaw. So I'm just uh, trying to understand uh, if there were to be any changes to what you're suggesting, uh, would we not need to go through a public meeting process? Because otherwise uh, the public will be sort of uh, subverted, shall we say, uh, from, from this process if we're changing a, a housekeeping bylaw to a, a full change uh, to, uh, to, to this. So I wondered if uh, Victoria could answer that question. I, th I thought you were suggesting a housekeeping bylaw to correct an error, not uh, what's being proposed uh, by the planner Simpson. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Uh, that is correct. Um, this application was brought forward by staff uh, for council to um, allow us to make this mapping change based on the information that we found, which was this previous bylaw. So um, obviously this application, regardless of it being housekeeping or not, was circulated to the public as would any other um, zoning amendment be circulated. And that is why um, the members of the public here today have made their comments. Um, us as staff, uh, we have uh, corresponded with the owners um, and their agents saying that, um, you know, suggesting that they bring forward a separate zoning amendment um, to um, to essentially ask for what they are suggesting today. Um, in staff's mind today, really the only thing in, in front of council is to fix this mapping error. If the, um, if the current owners would like to suggest a modification to that, that they would bring their own application forward and that would allow staff to review their application on the merits of current policies, et cetera. Because of course we, we haven't been able to do that today. Okay, Councillor Bocek. Sorry, Councillor Bocek followed by Councillor Hazelton. Yeah, I think so, um, Mr. Mayor. I think the only councillor that was around was possibly Councillor Wienko at that time. I think he's our only longstanding 
Councillor from 2013, and my question relates to that. The back lot that is in this discussion, um, Victoria, do we not have a standing uh, policy uh, in the bylaw already that says there is no development on back lots in this area, period? Uh, for your worship, Councillor Bocek, we do have specific provisions that, um, that relate to back lots. Um, the creation of new back lots and the official plan um, are not uh, are not permitted in this area, but we do have specific zoning for lots that are already created. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Hazelton. So I have to confess, I'm a little confused on uh, on the layout of what we're trying to talk uh, trying to deal with yeah. here the material that was presented uh, on the screen for us is uh, certainly a lot more uh, than the material that we got provided in our package, but it looks to me or sounds to me like um, the applicant is looking to um, retain a shoreline section for use and redesignate the back lot to open space, which uh, sounds to me like a, a reasonable uh, process. It doesn't appear, though, that the um, the the, the um, actionable actionable uh, statements or bylaws in front of us accomplish that. So I'm wondering, um, given what I think I've heard today, um, wouldn't it make sense for the applicant to um, uh, or for us to defer this to have it go back? Have uh, basically, it sounds to me like there needs to be a severance of a uh, re of a usable shoreline section. Uh, from the back lot and then the back lot designated as open space and the shoreline section retained as, uh, as a usable space. And I don't think that's in front of us to approve today, uh, but it certainly sounds like it makes sense to me. Um, so could I, Victoria, could I have you confirm that my understanding is, is what the applicant is trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Your Worship, Councillor Hazelton. Um, and Mr. Simpson can comment further if I if I um, not hit the point that I believe I can. So um, you're correct. So essentially this application was brought forward just to fix a mapping error that staff noted. Um, it's my understanding that what you mentioned is essentially what the owners of the lands would like to happen um, from this. However, um, you're right, that is not in front of council today to approve. And that's where staff has recommended to the owners and their agent to submit a separate application for us to then identify what would be the best way um, for them to potentially achieve that outcome, whether it be, for instance, as you mentioned, going through to the Committee of Adjustment first for severance, things like that. that. Those are things that staff haven't been able to review yet. So at this time, staff is just asking council to fix the mapping error and staff would be happy to you know, continue to work with the applicant and their agent on a separate application um, to, to identify um, what they would like to do in the future. I have a follow-up. Follow -up. Um, so my gut feel is that if we proceed with designating the entire property as it exists as open space, it may be very difficult for the owners to uh, shift an open space designation to a shoreline residential um, given uh, what we think, what I think we've heard about from open space perspective and the constraints that are there. And so I certainly wouldn't want us to be going forward and designating at all as uh, open space and then providing a, a future obstacle for the owners if in fact that's a reasonable process. So could you just comment on that? Uh, through your worship, um, I can understand where that comment absolutely coming from. Um, however, again, staff just feel that once a full application has been submitted by the owners that we can actually evaluate um, to see what exactly they're hoping to do. And we have provided pre-consultation comments to the owner um, regarding what we would consider as part of a complete application. And that includes an updated um, letter uh, and or report from the original uh, environmental uh, consultant to just ensure that their findings from back in 2012 are still relevant and it would also allow us to look at the policies. Uh, I don't 
I, it, I can't comment uh, at this time if changing it to open space would make it easier or not for staff to support a future application. It, it's hard for us to make those comments without a complete application in front of us. We're just trying to, to bring it back to um, what was um, approved by council back in 2013. Mr. Simpson, I've seen your hand a few times, and I'm going to allow you to uh, add a brief comment before I go to Councillor Jarvis. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, further to uh, Councillor Hazelton's uh, question about a severance. Now, the intention is, my client's intention is to keep all of the lands, the shoreline lot and the back lot as one contiguous property, so there's no intention to, to further subdivide it. Um, and the property is currently zoned shoreline residential one, uh, so my if the bylaw were to be passed, and this, this is certainly not a threat, but if the bylaw would be, were to be passed as currently proposed, my advice to my clients would be that they would appeal it to the LPAT. Um, and and, uh, and knowing that we're confident that there's no sound planning rationale for the shoreline lot to be zoned open space. Um, and I agree with the comments of Council Hazleton as well, that if, we, if it is zoned open space, uh, then it does create a new obstacle um, in terms of us having to um, go to uh, go to the, come back to council to seek to have it changed or reversed and if that decision failed uh, you know or if there was neighborhood op opposition it would go to the LPAT so right now my clients are satisfied with the current zoning both on the front lands and the back lands but uh, and but they're willing to accept that a rezoning on the back lands to provide further environmental protections in accordance with the Asmuth report would be entirely acceptable to them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jarvis, followed by Councillor Wienko. Yeah, this, uh, I think I'll, I'll just come back to Mr. Simpson's comments and I see that Jamie's on and maybe he can help. And I'm, this is follow up to uh, Councillor Hazelton's comments. I'm in agreement with Councillor Hazelton, but I'm now confused for uh, Mr. Simpson's comments. If the, if the land is one lot, how can part of it be shoreline residential and the rest of it be open space? It's either all one or all the other. And why would the applicants not want to, in effect, sever off a, a, a lot that would be a shoreline lot, shoreline residential, leaving the rest as open space, which to me makes it like Jarvis, sense. It is quite common for a single lot to have more than one zoning on it. Uh, okay, that's the clarification I needed. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. But I see uh, Jamie might be able to help us a bit on this. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, do you want to go ahead or because uh, Councillor Wienkel's waiting to add, hopefully his- I, just, I can maybe provide a bit of clarity here is that, and to be clear, there is no applicant here. The township has brought this bylaw forward. The owners of the property and their agent Mr. Simpson are commenting here on an application for housekeeping and it's a it's to fix a clerical error that's been made by the township uh, through the preparation of bylaw 2014-75. So I want everybody to take a step back for a second. So what happened uh, and this is the story is that an application was submitted to create a number of lots on Kings Farm Road. Uh, that application for consent was approved on condition that this lot that's subject to this discussion in this zoning amendment today was zoned to not allow for development on that lot so that it would be zoned open space. That was the condition upon which the lot was approved and the rest of the lots were approved. Uh, so this zoning bylaw comes into effect on condition. That was the condition of, of consent that gets applied. What Mr. Simpson provided to you is the staff report that staff said they had no issues with all of the lots being created at that time, but that's not what the township approved of the day. The township said, notwithstanding what staff saying, this property, this specific lot gets zoned so no development occurs on it. That's was, that was the decision at the day. So let's, let's fast forward to the preparation of 2014-75, which was being undertaken at the same time that this was occurred. I've looked through our records and we were never provided a copy of this site specific amending bylaw by the township. And that's why it never got included in 2014-75. So we got provided all of the various amendments from 1991 through until 2014. 
And for, there was a few along the way that did not get included, but this was one that did not get forwarded and did not get applied. So effectively what's being asked for today is to include a bylaw in 2014 that was previously completed. It's to fix a clerical error, that's it. So what Mr. Simpson's suggesting is that, that not only should the, the SR1 zoning, that actually he's right, it does exist today because there is a clerical error and this open space zoning didn't get applied. He's asking for those permissions to get applied through this decision of council today. And that's not the application, that's not what's before council. So Ms. Lemieux stated that if that's to occur, they should be, Mr. Simpson and his clients should be making an application to do that. She's he's completely correct in doing so. So the only thing before council, if they'd make any decision today at all, it should be simply to reinstate the bylaw that was passed that, that amended to 1991-19. It's a pretty, pretty simple ask. That's a pretty simple fixing a clerical matter. That's it. And if they want to try to reinstitute some development rights that that they weren't afforded through that previous application, then they should be making an application to do that. Because I can assure you that there's probably a whole bunch of property owners along that Kings Farm Road that oppose the original application that are going to oppose that change as well. So that's and and. Victoria and I would, or Victoria or whoever evaluates it from a planning perspective would have to evaluate that based on the planning merits of today. And that simply has not been done. So it's a very simple ask of council today. It's just to reinstate previous zoning that did exist through 9119 that for some clerical reason wasn't included in, 90, uh, in the current zoning bylaw. That's it, it's very simple, thanks. All right, thank you. Councillor Anko, do you by chance recall this all happening? Yes, but I think most of the uh, discussion at the time was the creation of those uh, three or four lots because there were some water courses involved and a whole bunch of other environmental issues. So it was mainly on the four lots that we spent a lot of time on. I mean, it meant over three or four meetings. But yes, I do remember that the, that the uh, the back lots were all going to be uh, designated either EP or uh, open space. And that's what we're going to do today. So I'm in support of, uh, of, of this amendment. And if the applicant wants to come back and create a new lot down by the water there, well, I think a lot of people along that road are going to object to it. So I would let that uh, process work out, but I have no problem uh, returning all that back lot to uh, the designation that was supposed to be originally. Okay, council, um, before I ask for any further discussion, the motion in front of me, unlike the others, we weren't given an option. It was simply to approve um, the zoning bylaw, I'm gonna call it correction. Um, that's what's in front of us that I'll eventually read. Um, any other comments that anyone wants to make in regard to this? Councilor Cooper. Uh, just briefly, I think this is a clerical error that needs to be corrected. I thought uh, consultant Robinson's uh, analysis and is, is exactly bang on. And I think uh, we should, uh, I support approving this. So thank you. Okay. Moved by Councillor Hazelton, seconded, seconded by Councillor Jarvis. Be it resolved the Council received Development Services Report 2020-76 and enact bylaw 2020-90 being a zoning bylaw amendment Z20-18 regarding part lot 21, concession seven, Kings Ro Farm Road, 03002307 All those in favor? One, two, three. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, and I make five. Councillor Bocek, you're not in favor, I presume. Uh, that is correct. Thank you. So that, that passes uh, five to one. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.
<laughs> All right. I guess that's the end of our, that ends our public meeting held under the authority of the uh, Planning Act. Our, our next, because we're now our next on our agenda are our staff reports. And I believe the staff report will be presented by uh, Mr. Robinson, is that not correct? Yes, I, will, I can do that. Your Worship. Thank you. Sorry, we're dealing with a sunny day here <laughs> coming in the window. Um, so this is a matter that was referred from a previous council meeting related to uh, concerns uh, at the Oak Bay property from the condominium corporation related to safety concerns associated with uh, the Woodland Drive. And really it's, it's associated with the construction that's occurring for the clubhouse, for the boat storage building and the marina townhouses. So with respect to that, um, staff have completed a report and we were asked to have a look to see if, if there were, um, if there was any, any opportunities for an alternative access to be provided uh, that did not go through the woodland development. And we've consulted with the public works director, Mr. Sokash, and with the folks from Oak Bay. And there is no other opportunity for access through for an alternative access. What the folks at Oak Bay have proposed is they have proposed a, uh, and there's correspondence in the file, or sorry, correspondence um, at the end of the, um, of the staff report from the, um, Sorry, there's, there's, there was correspondence received from the lawyer for Oak Bay that details that um, they do have a safety officer that, that will be on site uh, during working hours, that they, there is a requirement that anyone that enters the site that they check in with the safety officer. So there will be boots on the ground, so to speak, provided by the, the developer uh, while the construction is ongoing to hopefully mitigate some of those construction concerns and ensure that construction traffic um, follows the rules of the road and uh, drives in a safe and orderly manner. So that's, um, that's the recommended course of action. So the recommendation here is just that it be referred to staff, that we see how those, um, how that response and how that construction safety officer works and does it alleviate the concerns of the condominium corporation? So just in short, to summarize, condominium corporation has expressed concerns. We've looked at alternative access routes and there are no alternative access routes. The owner of the Oak Bay developer has agreed to have a safety officer on site during uh, construction periods. And the intention is to, the recommendation from staff is to let's see how that works and see if that alleviates some of the concerns that have been expressed by the residents. But at this point in time, that is the, the that would be maintained as a construction access route. So if there's any questions, I can do my best to try to answer those. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much. Appreciate that report. Council, I have been advised that there are a couple of uh, individuals from the Oak Bay Condo Board who are observing this meeting and one has asked to speak. This is not a public meeting. Um, we certainly have heard uh, the, their opinions or their thoughts in the past. And if any of you believe that they should be allowed to speak again, we would have to get a, a majority vote. And because there is six of us here, that would still mean that we need four people to be in favor of, um, I believe uh, Ms. Laurie Russell is asking to speak. Um, does anybody want to hear further from them or are you just going to straighten on the discussion? Councillor Bocek, followed by Councillor Rienkel. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, th I think this is an ongoing communication between uh, the, the uh, board uh, uh, of Oak Bay and the, and the owners. And I think any communications that are 
are brought forward to this council meeting would be of value. So I would support hearing uh, anyone from the group that would be willing. I'd like them to keep it short because we've already heard most, but if there's anything new, then I think it's of value that we hear it. Thank you. Councilor, Councilor Rianco, you're nodding your head. Yeah, um, I agree. I like, to hear, uh, I like to hear both sides of the story. And we got the one side uh, with our uh, package, <laughs> the side of me of, of, of Oak Bay. And I wouldn't mind hearing the other side, as long as it's, it's, it's constructive uh, uh, comments, I, I would like to hear them. Okay, councillors, all those in favor of allowing Ms. Russell to speak, and I will caution you that I will caution her that uh, I would like the comments to be quite brief. All those in favor? All right, that passes. Ms. Russell, the screen. I'm, I'm presuming the lorry is female. If it's male, correct me immediately and everybody can be amused. Oh, thank goodness it is a miss. My memory was correct. The, the, the screen is yours, but I'm, I'm gonna encourage you, please be quite brief. Okay, I, I heard brief a few times. So first of all, um, I'll be brief in thanking council for the opportunity um, and thank you, Jamie, uh, for the report. I think it's just fair to say that uh, Oak Bay uh, and the board of the Condo Corp would love the opportunity to engage with Jamie directly. It's, it's clear from the report itself that Oak Bay has made an offer with some um, suggestions, some remedies. Uh, we certainly have um, practical experience with some of those suggested remedies already. So rather than bore you with the detail, I think it's fair to say that on the surface, it looks like OBD's uh, input has been accepted at, at face value. And we would just like the opportunity as we have been signaling now for quite some time to engage directly. So I think it's just fair to say that um, the Condo Corp hasn't um, partaken in this review um, other than our initial comments, I think that's an important step. And so in terms of waiting to see how this works, I think there's a better opportunity uh, to allow us the opportunity to meet with, with Jamie directly and possibly with the Oak Bay um, participants. So we really get some traction on the dialogue in a constructive way. Um, and so we can do some fact checking and we can give some feedback on some of these remedies in order to reach our end goal, which is a um, mutual agreement. Um, we do see the municipality having a critical role in this given the, the nature of the planning. Um, so we certainly encourage your involvement and if, in, if possible, um, the next step to facilitate a direct dialogue with the three parties concerned is what we would uh, welcome and appreciate the most. Okay, thank you very much. Councillors, any comments on the report or Ms. Russell's um, comments now? Councillor Bocek, followed by Councillor Wienko, followed by Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and hello, Lori. Um, being that we're kind of in the middle of a pandemic and, and uh, the rules surrounding that are such that in, in face meetings can't happen uh, within our township and, and uh, our township office is closed for, for visitors, uh, although our staff continues to work on. So my recommendation that if there was any communication between uh, the, the planner uh, involved in this and the Oak Bay organization and the ownership, it would have to be done remotely. Um, and I, I think that would have to uh, be arranged with Jamie and with Romus and with Lori. I'm not sure that um, we can certainly support it, but I'm not sure that we can instigate it. And, and that's really my comments. I'd, I'd like to see this happen. I think there is good communication here. I think we're moving in a positive direction. But with anything, there's little pieces that can be identified that can be made better or, or, or be better for both parties. So I'll encourage the, uh, the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Wienko. 
Yes, I'm, I'm encouraged that uh, there's, there's some lines of communications that have been opened up and that there's some, some, some plans to move forward in discussions. I don't know how far they will go and, and if there'll be complete uh, resolution of all the issues, but, uh, um, and I'm not convinced that some of the uh, suggestions uh, by the Oak Bay uh, uh, owners will, will actually resolve the issue. But I would think, uh, and, and I would suggest maybe at the condo board and Laurie, if you really want to pursue other options, it might be wise to hire uh, your own planner or engineer or whatever experts you need, because I don't know how much uh, council, counselors or council can de defend your position uh, if you want to change direction. So you'd almost need expert ad advice if you want to change direction and so on. So I would encourage that. And that would help uh, us to support any direction you want to go. Well, I like the idea that we are communicating and opening up and hopefully we'll try this for a while. And if it's not working, then I think we need to get uh, uh, some experts involved. Thank you, Councilor Cooper. Yeah, just briefly, I wanted to uh, thank you, Mayor. I would like to uh, encourage the ongoing dialogue between these parties. Um, uh, just a quick observation, I think the concept of speed bumps and uh, safety officer is helpful. Um, and when I say that, I think that's uh, a possible solution, but I'm a little bit from Missouri on that because uh, if it's one safety officer, they're not going to be there all the time and there's a problem. Um, and I think maybe identifying uh, a, an actual route uh, might uh, be sensible and if you can find, this is to Lori now, Lori Russell, that if you can find uh, some assistance to, to take a look at this entire site and see if there is a, a possibility, even if uh, a portion of a golf hole, I don't know not what a golf hole is, but anyway, um, there, if there's not uh, maybe a chance to uh, work a road through. Uh, I wouldn't have support any roads going through wetlands and there's all sorts of uh, identified areas that should not be used, but uh, there may be some way of dealing with it uh, through uh, the um, golf course. So thank you. Thank you, any other comments? The resolution that was prepared, moved by Councilor Jarvis, second by Councilor Wienko, be it resolved that Council received Development Services Report 2020-73 for information and if applicable, provide further direction to staff on the matter of Oak Bay safety concerns. Surely I think staff have understood that our direction will include um, dialogue. Councillor Wienko. I just wanted to clarify uh, who's going to be the our intermediate on this. Is it going to be Jamie or Victoria or somebody else or Jessica? Who's going to be our representative on that group? I'll try to answer that, but Victoria and Jessica, please jump in. Uh, historically, uh, MHBC has been working on the Oak Bay file on the, all of the various files, so I would anticipate it would be through our office, but Jessica or Victoria can clarify if they see, see that differently. They're not, they're not showing their faces, so I'm thinking, right. that, oh. <laughs> um, you, can, you can just leave that with us. We don't have a solid answer for you at this moment, but leave it with us and we'll, we'll make sure it gets taken care of no matter who it is. Okay. All those in favor? That is passed. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. And uh, let's hope for more dialogue. That's obviously the the necessary step to any resolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm just carrying on here because um, nobody's asked for a break. So I'll just keep on going. All right. Next on our agenda, new business. Use of holds in municipal planning 
Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper, before I hand the screen to you, I, I wanted to make a couple of comments. And I have, um, quite frankly, some concerns in regard to the letters that you shared with us that I presume you want to introduce for discussion purposes, because I've not seen any, um, any resolutions. My concerns are a few. The first one is, at last month's council meeting, I believe, planning council meeting, I believe we uh, made the um, uh, resolution to have planning committee review holds. And I'm wondering why you're bringing this in front of council when council had already decided that it should go to planning committee first. Um, and I, and you know I'm, I'm wondering, are you trying to bypass the procedure or bypass council or staff? Okay, I, I'm glad you're shaking your head, but it could be interpreted that way. Um, the other thing that concerns me in a much greater extent is the second letter which is reviewing a matter that came in front of the prior council that was in front of our council in closed session a number of times, and that was in front of LPAT who made decisions. And your letter is, the, the expert is suggesting that there's errors in that. And I'm wondering, are you not treading exceptionally dangerous waters by reintroducing a matter that has already been decided by council, that has already been decided by LPAT, and dare I add, you've already been brought in front of the integrity commissioner on that particular file. And I feel obliged to caution you and offer you the opportunity of withdrawing this item without discussion. With that, I will hand the screen to you, but I, I just felt that I had to give you that opportunity. So I uh, just to clarify, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not looking for a discussion. I didn't uh, provide a resolution. I was providing these two pieces of information that were offered to us, the three councillors, as an opinion. I'm not promoting one thing or another, it's information. And I want council to have the opportunity to see the same information that I expect will be going to the, to the planning committee so that when and if a recommendation comes back to us, that uh, we can have that as part of our um, learnings. And, and as, with respect to the actual, the second of the two opinions, I'm not suggesting that any litigation be relitigated or council decisions be changed in any way, shape or form at the moment at all. I'm simply saying we can learn from the history. And so the second letter is really a history lesson. The first one is an opinion as to what might be done withholds, that's it. I'm, and I don't think there's anything more to it than that. I'm not promoting anything, I'm, it's information. Thank okay. You. Okay, Councillor Hazelton can went up quickly and followed by Councillor Wienko. Thank you. What I would like to do is I believe we have um, a point in our current uh, procedure bylaw that allows us to uh, request an item for informal consideration, which gives us a more open opportunity for discussion um, and relaxed uh, rules. Um, and I would like to request that this uh, these items be uh, included for that informal uh, consideration. I'm not sure we've passed that procedural bylaw yet. I, is that not wording that exists in our current procedure, and, but it was enhanced? Um, to our clerk and then Councillor Wienko. Sorry. I'm going to apologize because both versions are muddled up in my head right now from <laughs> because I've spent so much time on the other one. I think there's something vaguely about that, but not overly. All I'm trying to get to is uh, if, if there is an opportunity to, uh, to have this as a more relaxed topic, I think it would be useful for more open discussion. And I 
I believe that was the intent that uh, Councillor Cooper provided it is an opportunity for uh, discussing some ideas that were presented um, that um, may have value uh, to us going forward. Well, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to um, open it up that way at this time, simply because this topic was is gone to the planning committee. And I think if we start discussing an item that we already decide should go to the planning committee, then why do, are we bothering having a planning committee? Councilor Rianco. Well, I think my question is to staff, uh, either Jessica or, or Karen. Why was this put in the agenda? I, I would assume when these letters came in, they would go to the chip. And uh, then if the councillors wish to pull it from the chip, it would uh, come along with the report report and a resolution. So I, I don't see a report associated with, with these uh, letters and I'm, and I'm surprised that they ended up in the agenda and why not in the chip? So I'm just, is there a process issue here? Because um, I think there's been a mistake here in including this in the agenda. And, uh, and again, I, I do agree with the mayor that uh, the first issue has gone to the planning committee and the second one, well, you can send that to the LPAC group, I guess, if you want to, because it's, you know, if, if they made an error, well, they should be told they made an error, but I'm not going to debate uh, the second one because uh, there's no issues uh, that we can uh, resolve there. But I'm just surprised it's ended up in the agenda and not in the chip. Ms. Gunby and or Ms. Way. The clerk had her hand up first. Sorry, okay. I just... Um... A member may introduce a motion to discuss the matter informally. If the motion to consider a matter informally passes, the chair shall relax the rules of debate, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't give any further details about how that relaxed rules shall proceed. Ms. Gumby. Thank you. Um, so Councillor Bianco, any member of council is allowed to introduce any item on a councillor agenda, whether it goes on the CIP or not. Um, he did not, Councillor Cooper did not give it to staff to go in the CIP, he gave it to staff specifically to go on this agenda. Yes, but if, if, if we put, people are going to put stuff on the agenda, don't they write a report and a recommendation with it? And we have neither one of those here. And so none of us know what to do with these particular letters. There's nothing to be done with them. He just, as far as I know, Councillor Cooper, he just uh, wanted council to see it. So there's no recommendation and there is no report. They're on the agenda just for council's review and consideration. Okay, then we should just move on then. Yep. Okay. Councillor Jarvis, is your hand up? Okay. Yes, there you go. I just got to get it right to that and move there. Um, since my name is on those uh, on those letters as uh, being sorry, requesting that information, uh, we got to try to give some context. That information was requested prior to the uh, quite a while back and um, and it's taken us a while to decide to get it to council. I think from an information purposes standpoint, it's very useful information. Both letters uh, are extremely useful information uh, for us generally, and specifically uh, the first letter and the second letter, if they accept it, the uh, planning committee, I think can make good use of both of them. And I think in that context, that's the best way to, uh, to approach this is information only and, uh, and hopefully to be passed on to the planning committee for their use. That's it. All right. I think we should consider this information received. Next on the agenda, bylaws, road allowance, Edmonds. This must be to our clerk. These items were approved in October, um, but the, the bylaws were not included on the agenda. So we're providing official notice, but the items were approved for the SRAs back in October. So this is just okay. the final process of passing the bylaws. The resolution in front of me, moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Douglas, and we're gonna change Councillor Douglas because unfortunately she has not appeared. And I'm gonna pick Councillor Hazelton just because it so happens he's on the top of my screen at this moment. Moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Hazelton, be it resolved, the Planning Council adopts bylaw 2020-082, being a bylaw to stop up, close, and convey part of Block A shown as road allowance on Plan M-188, Baxter, being Part 1, 35R-26303, 
now the Township of Georgian Bay, and adopts bylaw 2020-083, being a bylaw to deem part of Plan M-188 in the former Township of Baxter, now the Township of Georgian Bay, not to be a registered plan of subdivision for the purpose of the Planning Act. All those in favor? Councillor Bocek. Just a quick question of clarity because I'm unfamiliar with the procedures we're using here. Uh, Ms. Way, perhaps you could help me. Is this a, just a deeming bylaw to enact the bylaw? Is that what we're doing here? Short answer, yes. Okay. I understand why we're at this stage then. Okay. We should have passed this in a prior meeting, I believe. Correct. And there was no deeming in the prior meeting. I get it. Correct. Thanks. Okay. No other hands raised. I'll say all those in favor. All right. That is carried. Now. Now we're going into closed. Whereas section 2392 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended provides authority for councils and municipalities to close a meeting or parts of a meeting to the public if the subject matter pertains to a matter identified in section 2392. And whereas the council township of Georgian Bay deems it necessary to close this portion of the meeting in order to address matters under the following sections of 2392. A, Litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, re Moro zoning bylaw Z1832 LPAT. B, same reason, Jobin minor variance A19 48 LPAT. C, Eleanor minor variance A18 33 LPAT. D, Brandy's Cove Yachting Center, SPA, S22006 LPAT, and E, Macy Bay LPAT Lawyer. Now be it resolved that Council of the Township of Georgia Bay moves into a closed session council at 1217 PM. All those in favor. And that is carried. Therefore, we stop broadcasting and Councillor Bochuk is asking desperately for a bio break, so we'll start closed in five minutes. <laughs>